Welcome everyone. This is Amr Mushtaq from U Council. We're going to talk about restrictive covenants in employment contracts, and in this lecture, we will cover specifically the non-solicitation clauses. Now, this is our second lecture on this topic. We have previously posted a lecture which uh, talks about restrictive covenants in general and then specifically deals with non-competition clauses. So if you haven't watched that uh, lecture, maybe it may be a good idea to watch that one first before you watch the non-solicitation because uh, some of the fundamental concepts are covered in more detail in that lecture. <clears throat> but we'll talk about non-solicitation today and I will briefly talk about some of the basic concepts as well. Again, this uh, lecture is not legal advice. It is only for educational purposes. So if you have any specific questions regarding your own issues, you should contact a lawyer or a paralegal or the Law Society of Ontario for any referrals. What is a restrictive covenant? It is a, a clause in your employment contract that limits the employee's ability to do something during or after employment. Most of the time, these clauses talk about what you cannot do after your employment ends, whether you resign or whether your employment is terminated because what you cannot do during your employment is generally covered by some of the fundamental principles of your employment relationship. For example, you have an obligation to work in the best interest of your employer and uh, have, you have duty of loyalty and fidelity towards your employer. What are some of the common restrictive covenants? Non-competition, we have a lecture on that. Non-solicitation, we'll talk about that today. Confidentiality, and if you have any intellectual property issues with respect to your employer, there may be some clauses with respect to your conduct uh, regarding intellectual property. What is a non-solicitation clause? Non-solicitation clause limits the employee's ability to solicit any of the customers of the employer. So that's sort of one main area of non-solicitation. And the second main area is it restricts the employee's ability to solicit any of the employees of your former employer. So those are the two areas that are covered by non-solicitation clauses. In our previous lecture, we had um, taken the example of a dentistry practice, so we'll continue that example today. Um, we had said that, imagine you were an employee of a dent, you're a dentist, you work for a dentistry practice where there may be other dentists um, employed as well. You don't own the business, but you are just an employee of that dentistry practice. Now your employment is terminated or you have resigned and you have gone away um, and and you, for example, in your scenario, you have started uh, another business which is in competition with your uh, client, but you do have a non-solicitation agreement with your former um, employer. So in that situation, your non-solicitation agreement may limit your ability to solicit business from the clients of your previous employer or solicit any of the employees. You know, maybe you like the receptionist uh, at previous employer and you want to offer her a better job and better salary and you may not be able to do that if you have a non-solicit uh, agreement with your former employer. Similarly, you may uh, be you know, familiar with dental hygienists or other dentists that you want to attract to your business and you may not be allowed to do that. So in most of the cases uh, with respect to securing or safeguarding the business interests of the employer, if a non-solicitation clause is properly drafted, that is usually sufficient to um, safeguard any of the business interest of the employer from a departing employee. What are some of the underlying principles of non-solicitation? They're somewhat similar to the principles in non-competition, but what you want to keep in mind is that courts prefer non-solicitation clauses over non-compete clauses. And as I said earlier, um, in most cases, courts believe that if you are a business and you want to protect your interest, business interest, that could be sufficiently achieved through non-solicitation clauses as opposed to a non-compete clause. So a court will prefer a non-solicit clause in an employment agreement and will enforce it if it is properly drafted and, and has a correct scope. So court will enforce the non-solicit clause if it is properly drafted. And the standard that the court uses to determine whether a non-solicitation clause is appropriate is again reasonable standard. Reasonableness is a similar standard that was used in, in a review of non-competition clauses and the same reasonable standard is uh, used in, in the 
assessment of a non-solicitation clause. Also, the court will um, look towards the um, the wording of the clause to determine whether the wording is clear, there's no ambiguity, uh, the clause is not vague, and then it is narrow. It is, it is narrow enough that it protects the interest of the business, yet allows the employee to earn his or her own living through the means that the employee wants to engage in. What is the legal framework uh, of non-solicitation clauses that the court adopts in reviewing and determining whether a clause is enforceable? Again, it's similar to what's in non-competition. The court will look at the geographic limit and, uh, and, and closely review and determine whether the geographic limit is appropriate or not. A court will look at the temporal limit. We have discussed uh, both of these um, both of these factors in our previous lecture in non-competition, so you may want to check that lecture if you have not reviewed it. Again, if the scope is too broad, then the court will throw the clause out. If the temporal limit uh, is too, you know, is too long, or if there's no temporal limit, for example, the clause um, states that the non-solicitation will continue indefinitely, then the court will definitely throw that clause out and make it unenforceable. Then. It is important, which is slightly different than in non-competition, that the act, the action that you are not to do is solicitation. So the clause should be limited to the act of solicitation. Solicitation is you reaching out to a customer of your previous employer, you reaching out to an employee of previous uh, employer. That's the solicitation part. So the act should be limited to non-solicitation. You as an employee should not be soliciting. So what that means is if a previous um, client of your former employer finds out uh, by his own or her own means that you have started your own business and wants to and st wants to bring his or her, her business to you, then that's not solicitation. You are not doing anything to solicit that business. <clears throat> so in that case, accepting that business will be fine. And similarly, if another employee resigns and then it happens to apply for a position in your organization, then that may not amount to solicitation. So it's the act of solicitation that is um, that is prohibited. Now also, the court will closely monitor the scope of the limitation. So what exactly is it that you're not allowed to do? So for example, in case of dealing with previous customers, the, the clause may say that for a period of one year, you cannot solicit all of the, or any and all of the customers of the of the former employer but you know the company may be very large and you may have only dealt with um, you know a very small segment of the customers and the other customers you may not have dealt with them you had no relation with them while you were employed you did not know them uh, directly as part of your employment so is it fair to limit your uh, solicitation to all of the customers that you may not have even dealt with, or should it be limited to the customers that you had dealt with? And also, there could be another way of limiting this is that to say that you have to not solicit the customers that you had dealt with personally over the last one year of your employment or over the last two years of employment. So there is further restriction to the act of solicitation and the court may closely look into the language and determine what exactly is being prohibited with respect to non-solicitation and whether that prohibition is reasonable to safeguard the legitimate interest of the employer or the company. Now let, let me give you a real example. I'll, I'll take you to a case that was recently in 2016 decided by the court and part of it dealt with the non-solicitation clause. So let's go there and then we will read it together so that it will give you a real sense of how the courts look into these non-competition clauses. So in this case there was a non, sorry, non-solicitation clause. So in this case there was a non-solicitation clause and so the court, let's see how the court dealt with that. So here's the, the paragraph 18. By the way, this is on Canly uh, website so you can uh, you can use this name and to search in Canley and you can find this case. So paragraph 18 says the covenant in the employment agreement upon which Donaldson relies reads as follows. Mary agrees that in the event of termination or resignation that she will not solicit or accept business from any. So this is important and I'll talk about it. So not solicit or accept business from any corporate accounts, so any corporate account or customers 
that are serviced by UniGlobe Donaldson Travel directly or indirectly. So it's a pretty, seems like a pretty broad restriction and, and it doesn't even have a temporal limit. So how is the court, how has the court analyzed it? The court says it is noted that this covenant contains neither a geographical nor a temporal restriction on Murphy's obligation. So there's no geographical limit, there's no temporal limit, and you know, most likely on that basis, the court will in itself throw out this clause and not make it enforceable. The court further says, it is also noted that the obligation which the restrictive covenant purports to place on Murphy extends beyond an obligation not to solicit corporate accounts or customers that were and are serviced by Donaldson to include an obligation not to accept business from such accounts or customers. See, so where I, I mentioned that the obligation should be limited to not solicit, not that not to accept business, because business has a right to go wherever it wants to go. So if someone comes and brings business to you because they like you or be, because they like your business, because they like your customer service, they're entitled to do that. They're not stuck. They're not bound with your previous employer. So if someone brings your business, you are allowed to accept it. It's the solicitation part that you're not allowed. So when this clause says that uh, Mary was not allowed to solicit or accept business, that makes the clause unenforceable. It also purports to extend the obligation not to solicit or accept business of any nature from corporate accounts and customers of Donaldson generally without restricting them to corporate accounts and customers which had been serviced by Murphy during the course of her employment with Donaldson or even which were corporate accounts or customers of Donaldson during her tenure. So, it, so you see how the court analyzes the specific clause to figure out exactly what is the nature of limitation and then whether that limitation is reasonable or not. And in this case, the court found that the clause was not enforceable. So this is the case name that I mentioned, Donaldson Travel Inc. versus Murphy et al. 2016, Ontario Superior Court 740. You can put it in Canley and you can get this whole case and read it for your interest. What you want to remember is that in non, the non-solicitation clauses will be enforceable if they are reasonably drafted and properly drafted, so the court will enforce it, and the court believes that non-solicitation clauses are sufficient in most of the cases for the employer to protect its interest and non-competition clause may not be necessary. Again, the, the word of caution from the previous lecture as well, that when you are an employee and when you are negotiating, there's a typo, non, it should be non-solicit, you should take extreme care in negotiating non-competition or non-solicitation clauses. The first principle of negotiation is whether you have the leverage in that negotiation. If the employer is imposing um, an employment contract on you and your position is simply to take it or leave it, then obviously you don't have any room to negotiate to begin with. But again, you want to read the clause carefully to see whether the clause, clause is drafted properly or not. And if the clause is too broadly drafted or not properly drafted and you believe that the clause may not be enforced by the court, then is it worth it for you to raise that issue and give the employer the opportunity to fix the clause so that it could be enforceable if challenged in court. So some of the things to consider, and I hope this gives you a sense of how non-solicitation clauses work. We'll talk about confidentiality and other clauses in our future lectures. Thank you for watching.